All right, well, as we turn to the word preach, let's ask for God's blessing upon it. Father God, we do praise you and thank you as we do every week for giving us this great privilege to be able to gather together as a congregation that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus to offer you praise and worship uh, in spirit and in truth like we're doing just now. And Lord, as we continue on to look at your word from the book of Revelation, we ask that you would, as always, provide to us great insight and understanding so that we would truly grasp what you are communicating to us through your word. And then, Lord, please, I pray that you would convict our hearts and encourage our hearts to then apply what we are reading so that we would be hearers of the word and doers of the word, thus bringing you much glory and advancing your kingdom. Lord, this gift of being able to understand the word and being able to apply the word is a gift that you must give first by your grace. And so, God, we come before you now, uh, boldly before the throne of grace, asking for this gift. And we come with great confidence because we come in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, as it says up here on the slide, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 18, verses 21 through 24 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open them up to the New Testament book here of Revelation chapter 18, verses 21 through 24, uh, which is going to now conclude chapter 18 this morning. And it's going to then continue the overall narrative of what we've been looking at uh, all the way through Revelation thus far, which we've now been working through for a full year. And uh, so this is going to continue that whole narrative of what we've been looking at over the last year, and specifically uh, what we've been looking at over the, even just the last couple of weeks from chapter 18, uh, which fundamentally, uh, as you've been with us, you remember that this whole book is basically describing the, uh, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem as judgment from God for their apostasy and for the fact that they had breached the covenant with the Lord. Uh, we saw at the beginning of chapter 18 that the city of Jerusalem in the first century had become a spiritual Babylon, a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean thing, a brothel of sexual immorality, and therefore were condemned to fall, it says. And uh, this is precisely what would then happen to the city of Jerusalem in the first century uh, in the years between AD 66 through 70. Israel and Rome go together in war with one another. And it culminates in the year 70, back in the first century, when Rome destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple in the city of Jerusalem, killed over a million of the Jews, took over 100,000 captives, right? That event, which transpired in the first century, is what we've been arguing the book of Revelation is now prophetically and symbolically describing. And so, when we saw again, we saw that at the start of chapter 18, we saw last week in verses 9 through 20 of chapter 18, that uh, all of the very, we got all of the various people's responses to this great calamity that was happening in Jerusalem. When they saw the smoke of the city burning in Jerusalem, we saw that the kings of the earth, the merchants of the land, and the sailors all responded with great mourning and lament, uh, because ultimately it said that they had grown wealthy from Jerusalem's wealth, right? They were able to share in that luxury, and so now with Jerusalem being destroyed, there goes their wealth and luxury with it. And so they were very sad about what was happening, but when, then we saw that the response of the church in verse 20 of last week was to rejoice over the fact that Jerusalem was being destroyed, because God is judging his enemy, Jerusalem at that time, thus eliminating them and paving the way for the righteous to inherit the earth. And so the church rejoiced, the merchants of the land and everyone else wept, uh, and that brings us then right into our text that we're going to actually look at to conclude chapter 18 for today. So if you please rise as we read our text for this morning. Chapter 18, verses 21 through 24, this is the word of the Lord. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence, and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters, will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. And all nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all who have been slain on earth. Let's end the reading of God's word. May you write it on our hearts by faith. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
All right, so that is the passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at more intently for this morning. And as we were just mentioning prior to reading it, we see here now the continuation of these pronouncements of judgment that are going to fall now on the nation or on the city of Jerusalem in the first century. Right? That's what we just got done reading, these pronouncements of judgments that are going to occur. And so what we're going to do for this morning, like usual, is we're simply going to go back to the start of where we just started reading, work through the text slowly but surely, verse by verse, unpacking it as we go, and then after we do that, we will make some applications to our life today. So that will be our agenda, and thus, if you'll turn your attention back to verse 21, it began by telling us, it says, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence, and will be found no more. Okay, so, right off the bat, uh, at this point in the Revelation, the Apostle John, who is the one receiving this Revelation, it says he sees a mighty angel appear, and this is now the third occurrence of this mighty angel in the book of Revelation thus far. He made an appearance back in chapter 5, verse 2, as one who was calling for the scroll to be opened. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, he was holding the scroll in his hand. And now the mighty angel makes another appearance and is uh, doing something else. Namely, it says, John sees this mighty angel take up a great stone, like a millstone, and then he ends up throwing it into the sea. So this is what John sees. The angel taking up a stone, throwing it into the sea, and this is ultimately a sort of metaphor or a symbol because he goes on to then pronounce, so will the Babylon, the great city, be thrown down in like fashion here in violence and be found no more. Okay, so that's the first thing that John sees now at this point. Mighty angel, take up a stone like a millstone, throws it into the sea and says, that's what's going to happen to Babylon, the great city. Okay, now the first couple of things to note in unpacking this is that when he says, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down in violence just like that, uh, we can, once again, know with certainty that when he says, the great city Babylon, that he is, in fact, referring to the city of Jerusalem back in the first century. We can know that because the book of Revelation has already identified for us what the great city is. And this is now the fourth week in a row where, I'll be, where I will be quoting from this verse but I do so, I emphasize it so much, and I hope it gets seared into your very memory, so that when you are reading through Revelation on your own time, at various times, uh, that when you come across this, then you will remember it. And so basically, back in chapter 11, verse 8, at a time when, we were, uh, when it was making reference to the two witnesses, it said this, And their dead bodies, the two witnesses, will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. So again, earlier in the book of Revelation, there was reference to the great city. And the great city is identified for us as the place where the Lord was crucified. And we know that the Lord was crucified in the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, again, because of that, we can know with certainty that the great city is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the great city. That's, we can know that because Revelation has told us. Therefore, going back to Revelation 18, verse 21, when it says now the great city, Babylon, is going to be thrown down in violence, we know from earlier in the book that the great city is Jerusalem. And so what the angel is declaring is that Jerusalem is going to be thrown down in violence. Jerusalem is going to be judged and destroyed. That's what the mighty angel is communicating. And again, to make this point, or emphasize this point, he illustrates it, as we've been noting, by taking a great stone, like a millstone, and chucking it into the sea. So just as it plummets to the depths, so will Jerusalem in AD 70 be plummeting to the depths in destruction. Okay? And that very language of a stone plummeting to the depths in judgment is very reminiscent of other places in the Old Testament that uses the same language to get its point across. For instance, back in Exodus 15, verse 3 through 5, at a time when right after the Lord had delivered the Israelites through the Red Sea uh, on dry land, they were able to escape, and then Pharaoh and his army pursue, and then God closes the waters in on them and destroys them. It says this, The Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them, they went down into the depths like a stone. So again, that language of cat being sunk to the depths like a stone is the language that is used to describe how Egypt at that time plummeted under God's judgment. And so now in similar language, 
Jerusalem is being plummeted into the depths like a stone, again indicating that they are going to likewise receive judgment just like the ancient Egyptians did. Another instance of this is in Jeremiah 51, verse 61 through 64, at a time when Jeremiah was actually prophesying judgment against this, the nation of Babylon in the Old Testament. He said, or it says, And Jeremiah said to Sariah, When you come to Babylon, see that you read all these words, and say, O Lord, you have said concerning this place that you will cut it off, so that nothing shall dwell in it, neither man nor beast, and it shall be desolate forever. When you finish reading this book, tie a stone to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates, and say, Thus shall Babylon sink to rise no more because of the disaster that I am bringing upon her, and they shall become exhausted. So again, just as Jeremiah in the Old Testament prophesied that the nation of Babylon would be judged and made desolate forever, that's what was going to happen. And then to illustrate his point, he tells his servant Sariah to, when he goes to Babylon and reads this scroll, he says, after you've done it, then take that scroll and tie a stone to it, and then throw it in the Euphrates River, because that will then again symbolize that thus shall Babylon also sink and rise no more. So that very language of, you know, plummeting to the depths in judgment is used at various times in the Old Testament. And so going back to our text in Revelation 18, when it says now that they're going to be plummeting to the depths like a great millstone and be found no more. Again, this is the exact same language and wording that was used at various other times in the Old Testament. It's biblically symbolic language that Jerusalem in AD 70 was going to suffer God's judgment very soon. Just like Egypt and Babylon did in the Old Testament. Okay, so that's what verse 21 is communicating. That's what John is being told right off the bat, Jerusalem is going down. Which then brings us to verse 22 through 23. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters, will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. Alright, so, in this continued now prophecy of destruction that's coming against Jerusalem in the first century, it tells us, uh, actually kind of very reminiscent of what we were just seeing in the previous verse, the language that's being used here is very similar to various things that we see in the Old Testament. For instance, in the book of Jeremiah. At a time when Jeremiah was prophesying judgment against Jerusalem, in the Old Testament, so the 500s BC, right before Jerusalem was judged then, this is what Jeremiah said. And I will silence in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall become a waste. Or a little later on, Jeremiah 16, 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will silence in this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Or one more, Jeremiah 25, 10. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. So again, numerous times throughout Jeremiah, and we also see this language in Isaiah and Ezekiel as well, when God brings judgment against Jerusalem on those occasions, he uses the language of basically silencing them, right? Bridegroom, bride, silence. The mill, silence. Uh, all of these things are just silenced. And that was to indicate judgment was coming. Therefore, with that language being used elsewhere, when we go back to Revelation 18, 22, and 23, and we now see the exact same idea happening, that the sounds of all these things will be heard no more, this is again symbolic language for the fact that Jerusalem is going to be judged. Uh, they're gonna, they, things aren't going to be heard in there in her any longer. Right? Now with that said, fascinatingly, the various different uh, categories that are listed here as to what is being silenced, or what will be snuffed out, or what will be found no more, are as follows. You've got the musicians, you've got the craftsmen, you've got the mill, you've got the lamps, and you've got the bridegroom and the bride. Right? These are the five things that are specifically listed as you will hear them no more, you'll find them no more, they'll be completely wiped out in some capacity. And what's fascinating about all five of those categories is that all five of them have some sort of connection or symbol, symbolic you know, reference to the temple in Jerusalem. 
So for instance, with the musicians, we know that the temple had a Levitical orchestra and choir, as we see in 1 Chronicles 25. Uh, regarding the craftsmen, we know that the tabernacle, and then later the temple, was built by skilled craftsmen, as we read in Exodus 31, 1 through 11, 1 Kings 5. Regarding the mill, we know that the temple itself was actually made on top of a mill, on top of the, um, where it says, the, the threshing floor in 2 Chronicles 3, 1. So the temple itself was built on top of one. Uh, regarding the lamps, we know that the temple contained the holy lampstand with the seven lamps on it. We see that in Exodus 25, 31-40, 2 Chronicles 4, 19-22. And regarding the bridegroom and the bride, we know that Israel is depicted as being the bride of the Lord in places like Ezekiel 16, 1-14. And so basically, you put all of those categories or images together, and they all have some reference to Israel and specifically Jerusalem, and even more specifically to the temple within Jerusalem. They're all connected and tied to the temple, and thus, when it says that all of these things are therefore going to be wiped out, you're not going to find them anymore, they're all going to be silenced, this is once more indicating that the temple in Jerusalem is going to come down, right? which is exactly what Jesus had said even during his ministry to his disciples when they were marveling at the temple, he said, not one stone will be left upon another. It's all coming down. Jesus prophesied that that was going to happen, and now here in Revelation, it's again indicating that all of these things that are associated with the temple found no more because the temple is coming down, right? So that's what this is saying. And then here in, these, in the last bits of our verses of 23, then going into 24, it actually provides a couple of reasons for why all of this judgment is then happening. Number one, it says, for your merchants, or for, again, because, or for, why is this happening? For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. Now that, again, on the surface of it, doesn't necessarily uh, immediately uh, tell us why, you know, like just to have great merchants doesn't seem like that bad of a thing. And actually on the surface it's not. Uh, they had great merchants. We've been, this is kind of in connection with what we've been looking at. Earlier in chapter 18, uh, the Lord even promised to bless Israel, commercially speaking, if they would keep the covenant, as we see in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Uh, so this is, that's not wrong to have great merchants and to even become prosperous. Uh, but Jerusalem, as it said in verse 3, had grown rich from the power of her luxurious living, and to her shame, instead of using that great wealth to then honor the Lord and be a light to the nations, to draw the nations to worship the Lord, instead she had used all of that wealth to then just, you know, become fat in, in her luxury, and, uh, and then she drew all the attention to herself instead of drawing it to the Lord, as we saw the sailors even pronounce last week, when basically their, their final thought was, what city was like the great city? What city was like Jerusalem? Right? Which has an air of reverence to it, just like they were saying earlier in the book, you know, who is like the beast? Right? They were basically worshiping Jerusalem. So instead of drawing the nations to worship the Lord, Jerusalem was drawing the nations to herself in her great wealth. And for this reason, judgment is coming. We've looked a little bit again at a lot of this in the last couple of weeks. The second reason that's given here as to why this judgment is coming is because, or and, all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, which again is, I think, a fascinating charge to bring against Israel at this time, because if you would have uh, asked the average Jew in the first century if they were committing sorcery, uh, they would have emphatically said no, because that was against the Mosaic law. They would have said, no, we don't commit sorcery. Uh, and yet that's what the Holy Spirit says they are in fact doing. And so the reason for this, according to one commentator, is as follows. It said, Israel had been the priest to the nations of the world, ordained both to bring them the light of salvation and to be, or to offer up sacrifices on their behalf. This should have culminated in the presentation of Christ to the nations as the light of the world and the true sacrifice for their sins. Instead, Israel rejected Christ, the sum and substance of biblical religion. By attempting to retain the formal structure of the old covenant, in its rejection of the new, Israel essentially created a hybrid religion of occult, Satan worship, and statism. And so again, basically what this is saying is the average Jew in the first century would not have, they would have said, no, we don't commit sorcery. And yet, because they tried to continue on with the ceremonial aspects of the law, while rejecting Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the law, what they had basically created was a whole hybrid religion, uh, you know, that is more akin to sorcery than anything else at that point. And so for this reason, judgment was coming. And then the third reason that's given is actually then over in verse 24, which says, 
And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on earth. So now the third reason given for why judgment is coming against Jerusalem in the first century is because she had been persecuting the saints, persecuting the church. Uh, she is the one who was guilty of shedding the blood of the prophets and the saints. Okay? So this again, uh, ultimately, I think, uh, serves to highlight all the more as to the fact that the great city being referenced here is in fact Jerusalem because uh, going back to uh, what we even see in the gospel when Jesus was declaring certain things to the disciples, he says this in Matthew 23, verse 34 through 37, right? Jesus says, therefore I send to you, and he's talking to Jerusalem, therefore I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you, speaking to Jerusalem, may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. So again, Jesus, shortly before his crucifixion, tells us that Jerusalem was actually the city that became known for killing the prophets. Jerusalem was supposed to be the place with the temple and the special dwelling place of God on the earth, but instead of becoming that, or being that, she had instead committed apostasy, rejected Jesus, and thus was the city that kills the prophets. And therefore they were the ones, says Jesus, who's actually guilty of all the righteous blood that's shed on the earth. And because of that, it actually specifically says, on you may come all the righteous blood. Because Jerusalem had become the city that kills the prophets, they were going to be judged, says the Lord, and they were going to have to give an accounting for all the blood they had shed. And when was that judgment going to happen, says Jesus? This generation. He says to the generation he was talking to, all of this is going to happen in his day. He didn't say, you know, in thousands of years, some great judgment will someday occur. But he said, this generation is going to receive this judgment against Jerusalem. All right? So he tells us in this generation, and sure enough, this is precisely what happens in AD 70. Going back to our text, we see that Jerusalem is being judged for the fact that they had killed the prophets and spilled the blood of the saints. Again, this is all the further confirmation, I would argue, that the city in question, the great city that's being referenced here in Revelation, is none other than Jerusalem. They're receiving judgment for shedding the blood, just as Jesus had said would happen to that generation when he was still alive. And so, that brings us to the very end of the chapter itself, and when we pick things up again next time, we'll begin chapter 19. But for now, having just looked at all these couple of verses, we can now summarize, basically, what did we just see, right? In these verses 21 through 24, you put all of that together, what is this saying? First, we see that John sees a mighty angel take a great stone, like a millstone, and cast it into the sea, declaring that Babylon, the great city, is going to be thrown down in violence. Verse 21. So he sees that, and we've been arguing that Babylon, the great city, is Jerusalem. Therefore, he sees the mighty angel declaring that judgment is coming against Jerusalem there in the first century. Then, after this, the angel then declares that the sound of music and craftsmen, the mill, the light of the lamp, and bridegroom slash bride will be heard and heard no more, verse 22 through 23. We noted that these are all symbolic things associated with the temple, which is to therefore indicate that the temple is going to be destroyed in this judgment, which is exactly what happened in AD 70. And then lastly, it says that the reasons for this, the reasons why this judgment is coming, is because Jerusalem had grown fat in her wealth, verse 23, she had committed sorcery, verse 23, and she persecuted and killed the prophets and saints, verse 24. All right? So that, in a nutshell, is what our text is telling us. And therefore, with that said, we can now transition for the remainder of our time into our point of application. So how do we take a text like that, saying those things about judgment coming against Jerusalem in the first century, and then extract that out, and then apply it into our life today, so that we don't, again, just be hearers of the word, but that we would then become doers of the word, and thus become ever increasingly Christ-like in the way we think, in the way we talk, in the way we act. And to answer that question, like usual, we could actually look at a couple of different things from this text, but what I would like to hone in on for the remainder of our time is what we saw specifically at the end of verse 23, when it told us 
that uh, one of the reasons that Jerusalem was judged was because she had deceived the nations with her sorcery. Now, as we already noted in our walk through the text, most of the Jews at that time would have denied such charges of having committed sorcery. They would have said, no, we don't do that. That's against the Mosaic law. We, we don't commit sorcery. And yet, as we just noted, that's exactly what they were doing. And, uh, and again, we, from that quote we read, it's largely because they continued on with the ceremonial aspects of the law while rejecting Jesus, the very you know, mediator of the new covenant. So they tried to maintain some semblance of obedience to the Lord through the sacrificial system while fundamentally rejecting the Lord by rejecting Christ. And the Lord looks at that and he calls it sorcery. And this is fascinating because this is actually very, very similar to another account that we read in Scripture from the Old Testament from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, uh, and following. So in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, we actually read of an account where King Saul, who was the first king of Israel, uh, was commanded on one occasion to go and destroy all of the Amalekites, right? Just to completely uh, and utterly wipe them all out. Don't leave a single person living, man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. He was to wipe them all out, right? And this is just and right for God to give such a command because the Amalekites had committed great wickedness. And so, Saul takes his troops, they go and attack the Amalekites, and wins a great victory. He destroys them, mostly. But then he keeps their king, Agag, alive, and he also keeps all of the best of the animals alive. Okay? So he doesn't exactly do what the Lord said, but he, he mostly does what the Lord said. And then, when he's confronted on this very matter by the prophet of the Lord, Samuel, and Samuel says, why haven't you done what the Lord commanded? He said, no, I did. And then Samuel says, but I hear the animals. Like, you didn't do what the Lord said. And he said, well, yes, I, I kept the animals. I didn't technically do, kill all of them, but I did keep them, and I kept them to make sacrifices to the Lord. Right? So he provides very pious-sounding reason to explain his disobedience. The Lord said, wipe the wall out. He doesn't do that. But then when he's confronted, he says, yeah, but I'm going to use them for the Lord. I'm going to use them to offer sacrifices for the Lord. And then, in response to that, this is what the prophet Samuel says. 1 Samuel 15, 22-23. Has the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination." And presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So again, just kind of unpacking that a little bit. Saul rejected the word of the Lord, it says. Right? The Lord, he just completely disobeyed what God said. You know, he, he didn't fully obey. Though while still trying to sound like he did obey. See, I did keep the animals for sacrifice. So he tried to sound like he was still obeying while he was actually disobeying. And the Lord calls this rebellion. This is rebellion against the Lord. And then fascinatingly, what does he then even more specifically call this rebellion? Divination. He calls it divination. And because of this divination, he was then rejected as king of Israel. And so now you can perhaps see some of the parallels between this account and what we're seeing with the case of Jerusalem in the first century. Where Jerusalem also rejected the word of the Lord. You know, fundamentally, the word of Jesus, capital W, they rejected Jesus, uh, the word of the Lord, while nevertheless still maintaining some semblance of piety. They still continued on with the sacrifices. They still continued on with all of the temple duties. They said, no, we're still serving the Lord, while actually rebelling against the Lord by rebelling against Jesus, the Messiah. And thus, what is then in our text called this rebellion of Jerusalem? He calls it sorcery. Just as it's called divination here, and because of this, they were then rejected and judged by the Lord. And so, Jerusalem in the first century is kind of replaying this instance of King Saul in 1 Samuel. Right? And so, it's very fascinating, I think, that in two occasions, God takes this idea of outward obedience to him, trying to act like you're obeying him while you're actually rebelling against him. He calls it divination and sorcery, right, on both occasions. So again, why, does, why is this rebellion against the Lord called basically witchcraft? The Lord says it's witchcraft what you're doing. Now, witchcraft, to answer, basically, in a nutshell, is the attempt to manipulate the spiritual world around you in order to determine your own future and to determine your own fate. And you will often use various things like spells and charms and talismans and incantations to do it. Right? And all of these rituals 
which uh, that they do, they think will then somehow appease the gods or the spirits in some capacity to then help them do what they want to have done. And we know that all of this is actually demonic, right? When they're doing these things, it's actually, many times, it's not like they're just doing nothing. It's not like they're just literally wasting their time doing nothing. Often, more times than not, it's actually very demonic. Witchcraft should not be dabbled with. If you are, repent, get out of it, and run to Christ. But nevertheless, this is what, what King Saul and them are doing. They're, this is what they're being accused of doing. King Saul is being accused of divination. Jerusalem is being accused of sorcery. Now again, this does not mean that they were literally huddled over a witch's brew, you know, uh, stirring some sort of secret potion. Though, it is fascinating that in 1 Samuel, at the end of Saul's life, what does he end up doing? He ends up consulting a witch in Endor because the Lord wouldn't talk to him anymore and the prophet Samuel was dead. And so he wanted to get something, and so he goes to a witch at the end of his life. And I think there's some definite connection by the fact that he's accused of divination, meaning he actually goes to a witch at the end of his life. Right? So there's connections there. But nevertheless, even though they're not overtly brewing the stew, uh, the potion, they're not drinking the blood of goats and dancing around fires in the forest like we perceive of witchcraft being done today, um, but what are they doing? They're going through the motions of worship, they're making sacrifices, they're offering the incense, they're doing the temple duties, all in order to attain the Lord's favor while actually living in rebellion and disobedience to God because, again, they've rejected Christ. They, they're trying to keep the covenant while rejecting the very mediator of the covenant. And therefore, the Lord looks down at what they're doing and he says, this is more akin to witchcraft than it is worship. You're not doing real worship anymore. You're actually committing witchcraft. And this is why he calls it divination and sorcery at various times in the passage. And so you put all that together, all of these observations between King Saul and Jerusalem that we see, the actual exhortation application that I would extend to us is then, therefore, this. Beware of just going through the motions of obedience in worship while actually living in disobedience and rebellion against God. Okay? Beware of going through just the motions of obedience while actually living in disobedience and rebellion against God. Which, not, like, almost like as every exhortation we ever provide is, in and of itself is very obvious, like obviously don't just go through the motions, obviously truly obey from the heart. Um, but we exhort it to us, I exhort us with it nevertheless because it is a very easy thing to do if we're not careful. Like King Saul and like Jerusalem, we can say I've spared the best sacrifices for God, even though God is oftentimes said, no, I don't want that. I want you to be doing this. And we're trying to, like, be, but no, I want to do this over here for God instead. And so we can go through the motions oftentimes while actually disobeying the very clear commands of what the Lord has already told us to do. And so in the words of Jared Longshore, God doesn't want you to bring in the fruits of your disobedience as if they were sacrifices. He wants you to obey. And so the exhortation again is beware of it and preach this to yourself. Remind yourself of this regularly because, as we were noting even this morning from the Catechism, God knows your heart. Right? You can't keep things from Him. You could literally fool everybody in the entire world that you're, what you're doing is for the Lord truly and sincerely. You could fool everybody, but you can't fool God. He is not fooled. And so therefore, don't play games with Him. Right? Don't pretend to offer God your sacrifices when you're really actually disobeying His other very clear commands. Because it's very easy to do. So for instance, some of the ways that this can happen is for uh, some guys, it's, it's very easy to get enthralled with matters of theology or doctrine and to be able to, you know, pinpoint all of the particular details of every, you know, point of theology that you can think of, which is a very good thing. We should be striving to do this because this is part of the way that we love the Lord our God with all of our mind, as we're commanded to do. So we should be striving to understand doctrine, but a common pitfall that can often happen is you get so enthralled with every point of doctrine and you're able to articulate it very clearly, but then, on the other hand, you're neglecting your family, you're aloof, you're, you're being short-tempered with your family, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not actually obeying the very clear meat and potato commands from the Lord of what you're supposed to do. And the same can actually happen for ladies too, where they get enthralled with various matters of theology, and then the house is a wreck, the kids are running amok, dinner's never made, the, the laundry's never done, and it's very, you're, you're not doing what the Lord said to do, but you're trying to offer him these other sacrifices over here and say, Lord, but take these sacrifices. And he said, no, 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 I've already called you to do what you're supposed to do. 
The same thing can happen with the idea of volunteer work or even missions work, unfortunately, can get a bad rap for this, where you try to, you know, give all your time to these various things to volunteer, which again, in and of itself, is a good thing. You should strive to volunteer as you are able and to help serve. This is a great blessing to whoever you're helping volunteer for. Um, but what can happen is sometimes we can get so enthralled with those things, again, you begin to neglect your family or other very, you know, basic, other fundamental commands that you're supposed to be doing. And so you're trying to offer God these other sacrifices while neglecting the other things you should have been doing all along. Many evangelicals today will often skip church or skip corporate worship, but then try to justify it by saying, I'll just stay home and read the Bible. And I'll, and I'll pray at home, and I'll listen to Christian music at home, and I'll even listen to a sermon online at home, and these things will be my worship. And so we try to offer God our private devotions as sacrifices while neglecting the very clear command that He's given to corporately gather for worship in Hebrews 10.25. Right? So again, we were trying to offer God this other thing when He said, no, no, this is what I've actually called you to do. Or it can go the other way around, where you do regularly come every single Sunday, and you're very faithful in that, but then you go home and you don't live at all for the Lord, and you're completely uh, unzealous for the things of the Lord. You're just you're not living out your life for Christ at all. And so you offer your God, uh, unto God your daily or your weekly sacrifice, and then you go off and then you try to not do anything for the rest of the week. So on and on it can go. It's a very, very simple and easy thing to do if we're not careful. The idea of offering to God otherwise seemingly good things as sacrifices when we're actually rebelling or disobeying other very clear commandments that He's already done. And it's such a serious thing that the Lord on two occasions calls it sorcery and divination. It's more akin to witchcraft when we're doing that than not. And so be very careful not to go through the motions of obedience while actually living in disobedience. Preach this to yourself, preach this to your children, preach it to your grandchildren, and then, in faith, actually live it out. Right? Do it, obey it, to the advancement of God's kingdom and for the glory of Christ. <coughs> Father God, we do thank you and praise you for once again giving us this uh, opportunity to be together and to look at your word from the book of Revelation. And in light of it, God, we are asking for your grace to prepare every one of our hearts to be like the good soil from your parable, such that it receives your word and it, uh, and it ultimately produces a blessed, bountiful harvest of righteousness and holiness in our lives. Lord, guard our hearts from being like the pathway soil, the rocky soil, or the thorny soil which just either rejects your word or receives it for a little time and then falls away, or is just choked out by other various cares of the world. Lord, guard our hearts from being like that and instead to be like the good soil. Lord, guard our hearts specifically in light of today's text uh, to not neglect your very clear commandments that you have given from the word uh, in favor of trying to offer you other things while actually living in disobedience. God, guard our hearts from this. Uh, when we are guilty of it, Lord, we ask that you would convict us of it and that we would then repent and flee back unto you for help and as our refuge. Lord, again, we, we need your help to do this. Lord, we're all guilty of this at times. And so, Lord, just bring it to our attention. Uh, open our eyes to the areas where we have been guilty of this and so that we would then uh, plead unto you for forgiveness and then, Lord, help us to walk in obedience unto you all the days of our life. Lord, you alone have the power to give such good gifts, and so we come to you for them in the good name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The charge for this morning is this, as we just got done singing, our only hope in life and death is in Christ alone. Because he took on flesh, lived in perfect obedience to the law of God, was nailed to the cross where he bore the wrath of God for sin, was buried in the grave, and then rose from it on the third day. Because of all of this, and because he now stands in victory, ruling and reigning over all things and with all authority, therefore, the charge is, trust him in faith and obey his every command. Don't play games like King Saul or Jerusalem did in the first century, going through the motions of obedience while actually living in disobedience and rebellion. Instead, trust in Christ, obey His commands, teach the next generation to do the same, and so advance the kingdom and bring glory to Jesus. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.
can stay for the potluck, then that would be wonderful. And then after the potluck, we will be headed over to the lakes for the baptisms. And so allow me to just briefly pray for our lunch, and then we'll dismiss. Father God, we do thank you once again for giving us this great opportunity to continue to fellowship with one another over the, uh, together at, with a meal, Lord. We thank you for the provision of all the food that we'll be having. And we ask that in our eating of it, you would be mightily glorified as King of kings and Lord of lords. For we ask it in the good name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.